I have set out only to seek reform. Is law. Of my grandfather's Ummah. I want to enjoin goodness and forbid evil. And to follow the seerah of my grandfather and my father. Imam Hussein. Inshallah in this segment, we are going to talk about plurality. And plurality versus exclusivity. When we have these Muharram gatherings, Karbala commemorations, are we just doing this as a cultural ritual for an exclusive community that uh, fulfills our heart's desire for ourselves? Or are we doing this to take the message of Imam al Hussein and take it far and wide as far as we can? What is our aim? What is our intention? Is the intention for fulfilling some personal desire, some community-wide desire to make us feel that this is something we inherited and we just have to do this year after year to make us feel good? Is that the intention? Is it a feel-good intention? Or is it a more elevated intention where we're doing something feasibilillah, uh, something for the actual love of the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So, if we're doing it for the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, then we have to take this mission far and wide as far as we can. And if we're doing it for our own self-desire, then we're going to try to contract it and uh, try to keep it in closed circles as much as we can. Unfortunately, it seems that there is a leaning towards the exclusivity arena. In the sense, in the sense that a lot of the commemorations are riddled with lectures that have sectarian tinges. Lectures that digress away from the purpose of Imam Hussein al Islam and start getting into sectarian polemics. For example, you'll find people talking about Imam Ali Islam versus some of the other Sahaba and some of the differences they had and how that relates to Khilafah and how uh, the Ahlul Bayt were not in power because of that and that somehow ended up in Karbala and they, they link Karbala to that. I'm going to talk some more about that. But let me first mention that this was not the way of Imam Hussein Islam, let alone the way of Imam Ali Islam. Imam Ali Islam during his time reconciled and brought everyone together. And he buried the hatchet of any disagreements and disputes that might have been in the past. In fact, he had buried that six months after the Prophet had passed away. Or within six months after the Prophet having passed away. And again in his Khilafah, the hatchet was permanently buried from his side. And Imam Hussein Islam, they follow the same pattern. They bring people together. They do not want disagreements and disunity. They want to bring people together. And if they can do anything to take disunity and disagreements away, they do that. They want to bring the Ummah together. And so you see Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when he invites Zuhair ibn Qayn, and Zuhair ibn Qayn, he was of another group. He was of another political affiliation. One that was to some extent opposed to the Alids. And yet Imam Hussein alayhi salam has an opportunity to invite him and talk to him face to face and explain him the things are not what you think they are in the sense that we are people of unity we are people who bring the ummah together for the common good of the ummah to reach the common goals and to sacrifice for the sake of the ummah to sacrifice for the sake of this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Imam's grandfather Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought that's who we are we are people that bring everyone together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're a man who might belong to a different political affiliation, but you are someone who is dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means we are one and the same. Affiliations don't matter when you have the common affiliation of being a Muslim dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he brings Zuhair ibn Qayn into the camp. Now we look at our members and we see that so many of the scholars and the speakers they are firing sectarian shots and sectarian polemics, which is against the, the manner 
of Imam Hussein alayhi salam because he brings people together. And uh, in fact, they link the whole tragedy of Karbala to the early Khulafa, to Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar, for example, and they say that, you know, they set, or uh, at least Hazrat Umar set up Muawiyah as the governor of Syria, and then during the time of Hazrat Uthman that followed, then he expanded that uh, domain of uh, Muawiyah's rule, and then from Muawiyah came Yazid, and because of this, Karbala happened. In other words, they pin the blame of Karbala to Hazrat Umar. And that's a problem, because one, you're causing sectarian issues, and you're going a very far-fetched route to do it, because uh, uh, no, a direct route doesn't exist, so you are fabricating a far-fetched route for this. And this kind of reasoning is an extremely defective reasoning, but not only an infect, uh, a defective reasoning, but a very dangerous reasoning because it sows seeds of discord and fitna in the ummah. And that's a great problem. And that does not go hand in hand with what Imam Hussein alayhi salam would have wanted. It's not being honest to the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And let's see how defective this, uh, uh, this argument is. In fact, this argument can be traced back to Muawiyah himself because Muawiyah made this argument when Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir عن, when he passed away, then Muawiyah said, oh, you know, Ammar has passed away and the blame of this goes to Imam Ali Islam. And what was he saying? Because everyone knew or it was widely known that Ammar Hazrat Ammar was uh, going to be killed, the Prophet had prophesied, by the wrongful party. And so people had started saying that, oh, Muawiyah's party is the wrongful party. So Muawiyah says, no, I'm not the one who brought him to the battlefield. He fought the battle on behalf of Imam Ali alayhi salam, on behalf of the other side. And so Imam Ali brought him to the battle. And therefore Ammar uh, was killed by Imam Ali because he brought him to the battle. You see, this is the Muawiyah kind of reasoning. That should not be our kind of reasoning. And in fact, if we adopted the Muawiyah kind of reasoning, not only is that a tragedy in itself, and it is being propagated from the members by somehow tying Karbala and blaming it and pinning it on uh, Hazrat Umar. Um, if you adopted that policy, that uh, terrible, terrible defective policy, then this policy would hit at Imam Ali al Islam's doorstep himself. Because guess who made Ziyad, the father of Ibn Ziyad, the governor, right? So Ibn Ziyad became a governor because of the position, or it was precipitated by the position of his father Ziyad as the governor. But who made Ziyad a governor? It was Imam Ali alayhi salam. So can we say that Na'udhu Billah, Imam Ali alayhi salam was responsible for Karbala, for the tragedy of Karbala, because he made Ziyad a governor and that precipitated the governorship later on of his son, Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad la'anallah alayhi, and thus Karbala. So this is a very defective reasoning. It fans sectarian flames, it's done for a sectarian purpose, and it is diametrically opposed to the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and it happens on the members. And that is something that needs to be reformed, that needs to be rolled back. Because Imam Hussein's... Uh, purpose, among his purpose, was bringing the Ummah together for the sake of righteousness and justice. So we have to think about this, that uh, Imam Hussain salam, he gave his life for the Islah of the Ummah and for bringing the Ummah together. He was not someone who was aiming for a certain sectarian, small sectarian community and he's going to be their Imam or he's going to be the Imam of the Shia or he's going to be Imam of a certain group. No, that, he was not aiming for that. Imam Hussein was aiming for the Ummah as a whole. Imam Hussein worked within the framework of a Ummah. Imam Hussein did not work within the framework of a Shia sect or a Shia community. And right now the way we commemorate him is we are making him as if he is encircled and bound and boxed in to the Shia community instead of opening this up, opening his mission up to where it exists at the Ummah level. Not only that, 
there is this element of the Ummah killed Imam Hussein, na'udhu billah. And that's a very dangerous thing to put in the minds of our young kids. A very dangerous thing, a great poison to feed to the mind of our young kids. And you see establishment scholars doing that, and you see Zakirin doing that, and you see people, the Ahlul Mimbar doing that. And it is extremely dangerous, this idea that the Ummah killed uh, Hussein alayhi salam. No. We are the Ummah. And ask yourself, did you kill Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Why do you say the Ummah killed Imam Hussein alayhi salam? No. The vast majority of the Ummah loved Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The vast majority of the Ummah honored Imam Hussein alayhi salam. There was an oppressive government and it executed an oppressive plan. Why are you taking the blame away from the oppressive government and putting it on the innocent Ummah? This is a sectarian ploy that we need to get out of. This is the hand of shaitan. And we need to extract that hand of shaitan and pull it out and take it out. It's a very dangerous poison, a very dangerous satanic poison. Because Imam Hussein loved the Ummah and the Ummah loved Imam Hussein alayhi salam, hands down. There is no doubt about that. And we are the Ummah. The moment we start getting into us versus the Ummah, that is creating a great theological problem and a great social problem. Because when you say that the Ummah killed Imam Hussein al Islam and we didn't kill Imam Hussein al Islam, we are the supporters of Imam Hussein al Islam, the Ummah killed Imam Hussein al Islam, what are you doing? You're doing we versus the Ummah. And when the Shia communities get into the mode of we versus the Ummah, what are they doing? They're essentially saying we are not part of the Ummah. They are bearing witness. They are stabbing themselves and bearing witness to not being part of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's a huge theological problem. Don't want to go there. And why is it being done? For the sake of sectarianism, you would actually go to the level of dissociating yourself from the Ummah. And Imam Ali Alayhi Wasallam warns about this in the Hajj al-Balagha that do not separate from the Ummah. No, you have to be in the Ummah. You cannot separate out from the Ummah and be like the sheep that are devoured by the wolf. We have to work within the framework of the Ummah. That's what Imam Hussein wanted. He wanted to get all the different sectors of the Ummah to shed off their affiliation, their party affiliations and come together as Muslims. Because that's what the Quran says, come together as Muslims. Do not have these uh, sectarian affiliations. Come together as Muslims and work for your common good. The Mission of Imam Hussein al-Islam, the example of Imam Hussein al-Islam can help Muslims across the world. So if we are the true lovers of Imam Hussein al-Islam and true supporters of him, we need to take this message of his to the world at large so that people can benefit from it, inshaAllah. And to do that, we have to accommodate. We have to accommodate uh, and encourage and invite the non-Shia to come within the Shia gatherings and even the non-Muslims to come within the gatherings of, uh, and I shouldn't say Shia gatherings, rather I should say the Muharram gatherings and the gatherings of the commemoration of the example that Imam Hussein Islam had set so that people can benefit from that. We shouldn't deter people away. We shouldn't say the kind of things that would repel people away, rather the kind of things that would help bring people together. And uh, unfortunately, not only that a lot of times we end up repelling people away, but we end up repelling people who are within the family of the Shia communities away. We end up repelling those people who may be considered as the moderate Shia by the kind of things that are done and the kind of uh, distortions that are presented and the kind of uh, rituals that are performed that, uh, that end up being uh, repulsive to a number of people. And uh, a lot of times you see in the West and the diaspora of the Shia communities, uh, the parents are complaining and the grandparents are complaining that our children are getting away from our rituals. They're not doing the same kind of rituals that we're used to, you know, whether it be bowing down to the Zaris or asking the prayers there, or it be um, having a very frantic kind of matam, including uh, matams with the shirts off or matams with uh, uh, metallic implements or... Uh, you know, um, giving some kind of special attributes to uh, um, to alums and to zaris and um, all that, um, 
you know, and, and going a little too far with that, and so on and so forth. They complain that, you know, our children are not following those rituals, our grandchildren are not following those rituals. Uh, one thing which uh, I would tell the parents and the grandparent generation is that a lot of those rituals you're bringing back from India and uh, the Indian subcontinent, and those rituals kind of worked in that society for whatever reason that they were placed in there because that society was conducive to those rituals. And the Western society is not conducive to those rituals. So first of all, it's not a blame of the children and grandchildren. They, they see those things as weird because in the society they've grown up, those uh, rituals are weird. Secondly, we need to understand that there's a difference between Islamic ritual and cultural ritual. So a lot of these rituals that parents and grandparents complain about that why aren't our children picking these rituals up, they're cultural rituals, right? So as long as a child is on the Islamic rituals, it's okay to not be on the cultural rituals, especially if those cultural rituals have some kind of negativity associated with it. So inshallah, we need to uh, make sure that uh, we are not put imposing cultural rituals upon the new generation in such a way that you know, they are turned off and then they end up abandoning Islamic rituals just because they couldn't cope up with the cultural rituals. And we need to make sure that even the cultural rituals themselves are free of anything un-Islamic. They do not have any shirk in them. They do not have any bid'ah in them. You know, So for example, when uh, people uh, approach a zari or a alam and start uh, praying to Imam Hussein or praying to Hazrat Abbas for their hajat, you know, now it's actually introducing a shirk inside in, uh, a cultural ritual, which makes it un-Islamic. So we have to make sure that uh, our rituals are clean. They do not have any shirk. They do not have any dalala. They do not have any bid'ah. And uh, bid'ah is interesting because, for example, you could have a cultural ritual where you want everyone to dress in black. But when someone doesn't dress in black because, you know, they're not following the cultural ritual, you get mad at them. And the reason you get mad at them is because you have started thinking that this dressing in black is an Islamic ritual. And so this person is violating the Islamic decorum. And that's wrong. Because it's not an Islamic ritual. So anytime we start getting upset at people for not following rituals that are cultural, it's because we have got into the mind frame of thinking that they're Islamic rituals and that in itself introduces a theological problem because the moment you think of a cultural ritual as an Islamic ritual, then that's a bid'ah. And a bid'ah will destroy a sunnah. <clears throat> like uh, you know, Imam Ali al-Islam mentions about this in the Hajj al-Balagha, that uh, bid'ahs do not come in except that they push a sunnah out. So we have to be very careful that we need to make the distinction between what is an Islamic ritual and what is a cultural ritual. And we should start detaching ourselves from cultural rituals that are either defective or because they have been uh, corrupted by uh, shirk or dalala or bid'ah or cultural rituals that give a bad image and uh, cultural rituals that uh, repel people away. Because doing all that is taking away from the mission of Imam Hussein, which is to take his message to as many people as possible. So we have to ask ourselves, and I'll say this as I started at the beginning, that <clears throat> do we do Muharram commemorations and Karbala gatherings for a feel-good intention? It'll make us feel good that we have done something within our exclusive community, or are we doing it for the mission of Imam Hussein al -Islam? Because those two things are very different. And if our intention is feel-good, then our intention is not in line with the intention of Imam Hussain Alayhi mission. We need to change our intention and make these gatherings of Muharram and uh, the gatherings of commemorating Karbala to be the mission of Imam Hussain Alayhi a mission of justice, of social justice, of truth, of upholding that which is right, of bringing people together, of unity, and making it a strong community dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, help us, Islam, <coughs> help us in Islam, in reformation, help us in revival of the true Islam back to the days of Imam Hussain alayhi salam and before him Imam Ali alayhi salam and before him Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you for watching. Please consider subscribing. 
Also click the bell icon and choose the all option to get notified for upcoming videos automatically.